January of 2009, Gaza was bombarded for over a month by the Israeli military, and uh, the result was a collapse of the infrastructure. For 23 days, there was a horrendous assault on this unarmed population. Schools were bombed, mosques were bombed, um, all kinds of uh, buildings were bombed. As a result of that 23-day assault, close to 2,000 people were murdered, and of that 2,000, close to 400 were children. Gaza is a population of 1.5 million people. 80% um, of them are refugees from 1948. Uh, of that 1.5 million people, uh, half of them are under the age of 16 years old. When you speak about the civilian population, you're speaking mostly about children. Those are the ones who are the majority of the population there, and those are the ones that are being affected the most. The last day of the bombing, my friend Sharon Wallace and I got into Gaza, and uh, it was astounding what we saw. There was so much utter destruction that I can't even begin to tell you about all of it. A few weeks after that, I received a phone call from Dr. Mona El Farah, who's our project director in Gaza, and she said that um, people in Gaza wanted to start a project called Let the Children Play and Heal. And what it was was, it was a project that trained about 400 mothers to go into schools, to uh, work with teachers, to work with therapists, and to help the children through this tragedy that had happened. Kids were wetting their beds, they weren't sleeping, there, uh, they couldn't go to school. There wasn't a child in Gaza who had not lost a mother or a father, a grandparent, a sister, a brother, or a friend. And they were completely traumatized. And as um, one of the ways in which they worked with the kids was they gave them the crayons and uh, the magic markers and the paper and told them to draw what their feelings were and what they had seen during this assault. A woman named Susan Johnson went on a delegation last year and she saw these drawings in these centers and she decided that she wanted to bring them to the United States. She thought it was important to show the Americans what was happening as a result of our tax dollars that we send to Israel that purchases all of these horrific weapons that were used in Gaza. We flew off on July 24, 2009, with the purpose of seeing what had happened, the results of what the bombing and the invasion of Israel's Operation Cast led. I thought I was ready, and I wasn't. It just totally shocked me. The devastation was horrendous. No matter where you were, you could see it. You could see rubble. I mean, all it's my first thought other than the children is rubble just everywhere. We visited children's centers because children were part of our focus. And we went to, I guess, three or four. And the one center, the Catan Center for the Child, uh, we were to go visit. We went in and they have a huge library and all kinds of programs for children. And so I got more impressed as we walked through it. And then the director Reem wanted, said, had time set aside to sit down with us and talk. And um, <clears throat> she showed us drawings from um, art therapy classes that the children were, were available for the children. The first one, I just welled up with tears because it was a confirmation of what I thought the children had gone through. And uh, picture after picture she showed us and they were done by, oh, maybe children five, six years old. So, uh, I tried to adjust that they were there, and I kept thinking how beautiful they were and how tragic they were, and that a child had to experience all this to draw about it. I said to one of the people in our group, 
those, we, I have to do something with those pictures. We talked about projects that we could do because wherever we went in Gaza, the people said, all we want to do is live like everybody else. And I would say, I, and when you go back, when you go back to the States, tell people what's happening to us. Tell them what our lives are like with all that's being done to us, uh, the blockade, the siege, the day-to-day -day wondering if you're going to get bombed. And I said, I will. Uh, you know, I promise I will. And they said, that's what everybody says, and we never hear from them again. And I promised and truly meant it that they would hear from me and I would do all that I could. And then it, it, thinking about it, I thought, Art like this needs to go to the States for people to see. I got home and started thinking, okay, how, how are you going to do this? Well, first of all, they don't even have addresses on, you know, many of them for mail. And there is really no mail going around. Um, and one of the we had six centers participating, and they were all different kinds of centers for children. And um, there was going to be, in December, the um, Freedom March on Gaza with hundreds of people that were going to go into Gaza. A number, a number of the people that had been in my group were going on this Freedom March. They were going back to Gaza. And they said, okay, they'll bring the drawings back with them. It ended up that they never got in because they weren't allowed into Gaza. So we had no, but no, that plan fell through. And then there was someone in Gaza who was coming back to the States and she offered to, to bring the, the drawings back. And so I gave a sigh of relief and then she found that really it was too cumbersome to bring them all back. Uh, and also she was coming back through Ben-Gurion. And if I had thought known that, I would have said, thank you very much, but we'll have to find some other way because they would have been confiscated and destroyed uh, at, you know, before she could get on the plane. So then we began to look for other ways of getting them. One of the senders uh, said, okay, we can get them out for you. You know, they all were at this one center. And they mailed them through DHL. I don't know how they did it, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna pry. I was just glad to get them. And this was April of 2010. I opened the package and was just totally overwhelmed. Uh, by, by even the first picture. It took me back to Gaza and even back to Gaza with something I didn't witness. <laughs> it was like I had been there. And um, I cried for quite a while and then took out the next picture. I went through all of them and was just blown away by them and also very upset that children had to experience this. The image that it left in their head that will be there forever. It started out in Vermont. It was in Maine for probably three weeks or a month. It went to two different locations. Um, it came back. It was shown in Chicago, a number of times at a number of venues. I took it out last summer to um, the Midwest and then um, Mecca, the Middle East Children's Alliance, had w wanted it and a number of their centers that they sponsor in Gaza had sent pictures and so it went out to Oakland, California and that's really the only place there's been an organized protest. At that point, there had been none. 
We've been working with MOCA, with the Museum of Children's Art, which is right around the corner here uh, in another building, um, for six months. They were very excited about having this exhibit in their museum. We talked about different events we would do there with teachers, with kids, and talk about the exhibit and what it meant and what kids saw in it. And then two weeks before it was to open, the head of the board of directors from the museum came to the Middle East Children's Alliance and met with us and told us that they were no longer considering having this exhibit show there. And I was shocked. Um, we'd been talking with them, we'd been visiting with them, plan making all of these plans, and then for him to come two weeks before the opening and to tell us that no, we couldn't do it was very upsetting. And I remember sitting in, in the room at Mecca and thinking, this can't be happening. We'd sent out all these postcards, thousands of postcards. It was all over the internet. We were very excited about it. And I said to him, I said, I'm very angry by what you're doing, and I feel that um, the people who are really hurt by your actions, by the actions of the museum, are the children in Gaza. And I feel that we as Mecca have a responsibility to those kids to show their art. And we decided after they left that we were going to show this art, whether it was inside the museum if they changed their mind or if it was outside the museum. But on September 23rd, we were going to show it. There was a very organized opposition to it who had a very organized plan of putting pressure on the museum not to show it. There was a great deal of press involved in this because very brilliantly, I think, Mecca did not back up. They said, okay, this is the information that we have that went out. This was very organized. Uh, we don't like censorship. And so now it had a censorship issue involved with it. We went all over Oakland looking for an empty space to show the exhibit. And nobody would rent the space to us. And finally, we saw this space that we're in right now. And the people that own this property were very nice. They rented it to us at a very reduced rate. And we signed the lease 24 hours before the exhibit opened. And it was really quite a moment. Uh, everybody came to the museum around the corner. And we had made a copy of the exhibit. And we gave a piece of the art to like 48 people to hold the exhibit up. And a band came and they were playing music. And over 500 people came to be part of this exhibit and the opening outside. And at one point, we told people to march with us around the corner with the art. And they did, and they came here to this space. And nobody knew that this had happened, that we'd set it up in 24 hours. It was a great moment, and over the two months that it's been hanging here, hundreds and hundreds of people have come to see the exhibit. Some schools have come, some church groups, all kinds of people. I think it's really the most important thing to remember is that the museum, um, they had no backbone. They couldn't stand up to the Zionist organizations that were pressuring them. What this is all about is about the um, East Bay Federation, Jewish Federation, uh, applying pressure to the board of the, of the MOCA Museum and telling them that they're going to lose their funding. They called their funders. And in fact, they had a Twitter online that said, congratulations to all the Jews of the East Bay for making sure that this exhibit was not going to be seen at MOCA. Shame on them. It wasn't the museum. The board had no backbone. They couldn't stand up to these Zionist organizations. It was those Zionist organizations whose fault it is that this exhibit was not shown. 
these organizations in one form or another have been twisting the arm of many groups, many organizations, many speakers, and they've come after the Middle East Children's Alliance before. About eight years ago, we had an art exhibit called Justice Matters, and it was in collaboration with the Berkeley Art Museum, Berkeley Art Center, and um, about eight rabbis went to see Mayor Tom Bates and tried to pressure him to take the exhibit down and to defund the Berkeley Art Center because they showed this exhibit which they said was anti-Semitic. And I have to say that Tom Bates stood up to them and said that he believes in free speech and that the museum has the right, this Berkeley Art Center has the right to show the exhibit. So we're very familiar with these guys. About a year ago, many of these Jewish Zionist groups, the Jewish Federation of the East Bay, actually the National uh, Federation of the, uh, across the country, and the ADL, um, they committed $6 million to use to fight these kinds of fights. They want to stop anybody who speaks out for justice in Palestine and they want to stop any discussion of what Israel is and what it has done for 63 years. When people learn that Palestinians in Gaza exist and are suffering under the kind of onslaught that we saw, then it changes everyone's understanding about what's going on in Israel-Palestine. The supporters of Israel that are part of this lobby do want to silence the Palestinian voice. They don't want people to be aware of it. They don't want people to see Palestinian children's art. Uh, it, it gets in the way of the false narrative that we've all been led to believe. I think it's important for people to know what they're getting into. I, I think people are blindsided when they do something about Palestine, about children's art, or something that would normally not be considered controversial. Organizations, museums need to be warned probably that this is what they, they will be up against, that there will be donors that will tell them that they're very unhappy with their plan to do this type of event. And they need to stand by their principles and not cave in to that kind of pressure. I would not be sitting here in California had they not had this controversy in Oakland. Uh, they shot themselves in the foot with it as far as a child's view from Gaza goes. Um, I had envisioned initially that it would be Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, which are areas that the people who went in with my group are from. I mean, I never would have thought that it would be going all over, never. I had more requests for the exhibit than I could possibly handle, including about 10 from Europe. Uh, there were some from Canada, so I responded to those. Um, there are now three, three exhibits out of all the, the drawings that I've had. It's been broken down into smaller exhibits, and there are three of them in Canada, right, as we speak, going in all different directions. Uh, and in the United States since then, the issue in Oakland, uh, when it left Oakland, it went to Boise, Idaho, and Wichita, Kansas, and New Orleans, and places in California, and then uh, back to Chicago, where it was there for quite a while going to places. And it also brought in people from colleges. Who wins? I think that the kids in Palestine won this time. And I think they won because the community said, we're not going to listen to these Zionist groups. We're going to come see the art. We're going to come and we're going to demonstrate. And we're going to keep coming to see the art and support the Middle East Children's Alliance. I think the losers really are the Zionist groups and the Museum of Children's Art because the museum looks ridiculous and the Zionist groups show themselves to be who they are. 
And I think that they're the big losers. And I, what saddens me is that um, I think that we Jews, I'm Jewish, I think that we are the big losers um, also. Because I think that um, people see this and hear about these kinds of intimidations, and sometimes they lump us all together, forgetting that there are many people like myself who have nothing to do with those groups other than to be attacked by them and who believe in justice for Palestinians and believe in the right of return. And um, it's a worry to me. The children are my main concern. And that doesn't mean I'm not concerned about others. I truly am. Uh, on both sides. I don't want anybody going through trauma. But the children in Gaza, if you look at them now, and, and they're plain, and then there are ones with a totally blank face. It's as though they've put on a mask because they can't deal with what they've witnessed and what they're feeling. Um, they're going to grow up really angry, really angry. And we are going to have horrendous problems. Um, that's scary. The issue which I think should always be taken into consideration is what type of long-term effect these policies have on the psychological well-being and mental health of the population in Gaza. We know very well um, that there is a high level of post-traumatic stress dis disorder, PTSD, among children in Gaza. Some say as high as 95% of all children in Gaza suffer from some form of symptoms uh, as a result of living under these conditions where they're exposed to violence, rockets, helicopters, assassinations in the middle of the street, the closures, the, la the cutting off of electricity, which is a common practice. Uh, there's only six hours of electricity every day in Gaza. Um, kids going to school and, and uh, under in uh, schools which have been damaged by Israeli bombs, um, and most importantly, seeing the fear and the insecurity that comes from parents who are unable to protect their children, who are unsure um, what tomorrow will bring for them uh, when bombs are falling and when people are being killed, relatives are being killed on a daily basis, which happens in Gaza quite frequently. Um, the type of psychological impact that has within a family within a society can't be adequately measured. And the problem for organizations like ours and any organization who wants to address these issues adequately, let's say we want to do a project to deal with chil children who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder in Gaza, it's impossible to do it effectively because the root cause of this disorder remains in place. So if you try to treat one, ch one child or 100 children or 1,000 children, 10,000, and I said 95% of the kids there, it's been estimated, suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. That means over 500,000 children suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder in the Gaza Strip. How do you treat 500,000 children when the root cause, which is the violence of the Israeli occupation, uh, remains in place? What is the long-term effect of a whole generation growing up with post-traumatic stress disorder? What is the long-term implications for that society and for the larger region as a whole? Um, nobody knows, but let's say it's not a positive one. That when children are brought up um, from the age of uh, zero to 18, every day being exposed to violence, being exposed to a siege and an occupation which is denying them their basic rights and access to the outside world. And in addition to that, the knowledge that people there are not stupid, the knowledge that the outside world, the international community is doing nothing about it that is talking about democracy and freedom in the region, but when it comes to Gaza, says nothing, does nothing when their freedom and democracy is being denied, and doesn't do anything to intervene on the, to prevent or stop the human rights violations which occur there on a daily basis. People there become very frustrated and cynical about the West and about uh, the United States government, the United Nations, the Europeans, um, the Arab regimes. And this also produces, in my opinion, a very negative implication for the future in that region. I'm passionate about trying to bring about some understanding about the situation, or at least stimulate interest that people will look further. 
I would hope that people looking at the exhibit would leave it better informed about what the people in Gaza are going through by these children. My purpose for, for this project was to make people more aware of what's happening in Gaza. Um, I, I am not one to try and say, this is what you should believe, I believe that way, you should believe that way. I'm going to convince you that this is the way to go. I used to be that way. You know, I couldn't understand why everybody didn't believe the way I did because I saw the true way. And uh, now, you know, I've finally matured late in my life um, that, okay, I will dispense this information. I will show these drawings. I will show pictures. I will give my experience. And what you do with it is your thing. I just do it. If we start to see the reality and the truth of what life is like in Palestine, not the way that it's presented through the American media uh, or uh, the propaganda which surrounds this issue outside, but when you start to see the facts, if we start to see how people are suffering there, to see the truth, to see the reality, then there has to be a shift in U.S. policy towards that region. So the first step is to not deny the Palestinians the chance to express themselves and to see the truth. Because once the truth is seen, then this false and immoral and illegal policy towards the Palestinians will have to change.